Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the aquarium. I'm Jerry Schubel. I think I know almost everybody here. Uh, I think for those of you who came in, you know that there's a party going on out in the Great Hall. And so if you, we're all going to use the door off to the left. And if you need to go to a restroom, there will be somebody out there to guide you. We're keeping that back row clear. So if anybody has to walk, go out, they can walk through the back row and not uh, disturb the speaker up front, although I'm sure it wouldn't bother him if, if you went forward. This is going to be a very special evening, and uh, there was a, a, first I want to thank our sponsor, Gazette Newspapers, but some of you have heard me talk about uh, a little book called Happiness by William Lyon Phelps. It's a wonderful little book. He was a, an English professor at Yale University. He wasn't the greatest scholar but he was one of their greatest teachers ever, and he made literature come alive in, in ways very few people could. And in the book, Happiness, he says that the happiest person in the world is not the wealthiest person, or the healthiest person, or the most beautiful, or the most handsome. The happiest person in the world is the one who thinks the most interesting thoughts. And the primary reason that we have these lectures is to help all of us think more interesting thoughts. Now, not everybody agrees that this is the, the real source of happiness. And I want to give you two alternate views that I came across today. Thomas, can I get that first one? You'll feel better after you've eaten someone. So that's another way of being happy. Or, Thomas, the next one, please. If you could get rid of one thing in your life, this guy's asking his wife, would it be gluten? And there she is in the back with the gun. I'm sure that there are many spouses in the audience who can relate to this as a source of happiness. But tonight, you're going to be treated to a very special lecture that will make you think very interesting thoughts. You can take, take that off before anybody gets any ideas what they want to do when they go home. Um, <clears throat> now, before I introduce our speaker, I had promised a long time ago that we were going to give you a, an update on the forum that we had. It was called After the Gulf, What Did We Learn? And that was in October 21st and 22nd. I'm going to give you just a few of the highlights of what happened at that workshop. On the first day, we focused on how to prevent another blowout from occurring and to respond more efficiently and more effectively when one does occur or if one does occur. And the second day, we focused on whether the Gulf could be a wake-up call for the consequences of having this heavy dependency on oil. We chose not to focus on the environmental effects because there were a lot of people, like our speaker this evening, who have a lot more expertise and are there with teams in the field from the day or the day after this happened and continue to study its effects. But there was li relatively little attention being given to prevention and response and to using it as a wake-up call. On preventing another blowout among our experts, there was unanimous agreement that the number one priority to prevent such a reoccurrence is to have a culture of safety, not a safety culture, and there's a difference, a culture of safety throughout the offshore oil and gas industry and in every one of the oil companies, and that it needs to start at the top of the organization and be carried down to every single person working on a platform, and that anyone working on a platform who sees something going wrong has the authority to stop the operation, knowing that he or she will have the support of everyone all the way up the chain. And in, when we wrote the first section of, of our report, and I remember this was before the, the National Committee's report came out, they have come to the same conclusion. This was not the situation at, on Deepwater Horizon. There was not a culture of safety. Safety has to trump everything else. The other thing that was very clear is that if you want this to happen, the people responsible for safety with the, the administrative responsibility can't be the same people or person responsible for schedule and production. And the same individual on Deepwater Horizon had the responsibility 
for safety and for production and schedule, and you can you know who wins. Now, in terms of the day two, reducing our dependency on oil, there was a, a unanimous agreement again that uh, if we don't act decisively and quite quickly to reduce our dependence on oil to a significant extent and, and, and do it within another decade or two, that we will almost certainly exceed the plus two degrees Celsius above the uh, pre-industrial temperature that the, a number of countries have agreed with is the limit beyond which there will be irreversible uh, consequences. And, and um, we're already halfway to that plus two degrees. And we also explored how one could have a campaign that could be translated or transformed into a movement to reduce the reliance on oil. But as long as we're using oil, we're going to be getting oil out of the ocean. We will be getting oil out of the Gulf of Mexico because that's where much of it is. And we will be moving increasingly into deeper water. The other thing people wanted to know about was how did the Gulf of Mexico situation compare to California? Could the same thing that happened there happen here? And the answer is that, it, that it, the probability of it, something like that happening in California is extraordinarily low. First of all, the oversight on California's platforms is far superior than, than the federal oversight in the, uh, in the Gulf. We have, uh, they have 4,000 platforms. Uh, and probably 40,000 wells, and we have less than 1% of that number. And the fields off California are all mature fields, and they are not under significant pressure. So that if somebody came along and, and knocked over a platform, there's enough hydrostatic pressure from the overlying water that it would seal itself off. So it's a totally different situation in California than in the Gulf. Now, our full report will be coming out within a couple of weeks. It will be on our website, but I promise you that we will also have a public forum where we will describe all of the, the results of that workshop. Now, we're going to hear from a, an expert who spent uh, a lot, much of his life studying the Gulf of, of Mexico. He received his PhD from Texas A&M University, and he is the executive director of the Hart Research Institute for Gulf of Mexico Studies. In that capacity, he leads an interdisciplinary team that integrates science, policy, and socioeconomic expertise to help assure an environmentally and economically sustainable Gulf. He's been the executive director there for three years, I think. Right, Larry? Three? And uh, before that, he spent 23 years working for the state and being responsible for much of its, its wildlife. He was the state trustee for natural resources, and he built the natural resources damage assessment program, and he served as chair of the EPA Science Advisory Committee for the Gulf. He directed oil spill responses. He established over 30 marine protected areas of various types. We have this, he has this remarkable combination of being an outstanding scientist and having been a steward for the living resources in the Gulf. He's also active with uh, lots of groups. He, he uh, has state lead for the ecosystem assessment and integration team of the Gulf Alliance. He chairs the Flower Gardens National Marine Sanctuary Advisory Committee, Texas State Sea Grant Advisory Committee, and he's very involved with the Texas State Aquarium that we at this aquarium also are working on a partnership with. You're going to enjoy this lecture, and you're going to learn a lot, and you're going to think more interesting thoughts. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Dr. Larry. Thank you. Wow. I don't know if I can live up to all that, but I appreciate, appreciate the opportunity to be here with you uh, uh, tonight uh, and to talk about uh, the, the issue uh, with the Deepwater Horizon oil spill and how it may be relevant to you. And we get that, I get that question. I've traveled. Uh, all around the country, actually, talking about the oil spill uh, at different aquariums, uh, shed aquarium just, just recently. Uh, and I'll be going over to St. Petersburg, Russia, to talk about it there, so there's international uh, interest in it as well. And, and I think it should be, because it is relevant to, uh, to lots of what we're, we're doing. And not, I'll try to make some of those points where it's directly relevant to us here, but, but also the whole issue of how do you balance environmental protection 
and economic development of the type we're talking about. Because we're going to have to do that. We need to do that. We're going to have to uh, for a foreseeable future. This is something we must be able to, to manage uh, if we want to have a future that we all want to look forward to. So I think the biggest lessons that here uh, that can come out of this issue is, is how can we do that and, and what can we learn to do better in the future because we really have no choice. We have to do so. So I'm going to focus on three things with this here. First of all, how could something like this happen? Uh, why should we even care about the Gulf of Mexico or whatever happened there? And then uh, the question, of course, is will the Gulf recover it as, it, as it goes forward? So let's try to do that now. First, uh, you get just a little bit of a commercial, not much, uh, but it also puts in context kind of how I come at these issues. The Heart Research Institute is a marine science institute. We have uh, the basic components that you expect, biologists, the chemists, and geologists. But we take it a, a step further, and we brought in uh, uh, econ economists, and marine policy experts bring them all together in the institute with the idea of not just doing only doing basic science, but taking that science and, uh, and applying it to solving problems and developing policies for, for ocean management. And so that's what we're focused on. In the Gulf of Mexico, of course, that's our, our focus at the Gulf as a whole. Yet we will not realize that you can't do that just in the U.S., that uh, there's many countries, several countries around the Gulf. We have very active programs with both Cuba and, and Mexico uh, and these types of things. So that's, that's how we kind of come at it. So let's take a first uh, look at the first question of, of how could something like this could happen. And my first kind of point is that well, basically it's complacency. Uh, as we talked about in the Gulf of Mexico, there's over 4,000 uh, platforms in the shallow waters of the Gulf, over 40,000 wells themselves. This is a, a uh, this is where the oil is, and the, this whole industry developed uh, off Louisiana and Texas and Mississippi uh, in shallow water. And frankly, it does so with, with great success. There were accidents. There are problems. But those issues have been addressed and dealt with uh, as they moved along. And of course, as these oil and gas programs developed, they moved further and further offshore, starting initially right on the marshlands, which is a whole other problem, uh, but uh, more and more water. As they went forward, uh, they took that technology and moved them out off the continental shelf at about 600 feet of depth, down to four and 5,000 feet where deep water horizon is. But we're not stopping there. Right now, we have a platform out in 10,000 feet of water. And this type of thing. So basically, the concern, or what happened, it seems, from one perspective, is we took technology that worked well in shallow continental shelf waters, and did we move it out into those deep waters uh, before we were really, really ready? And we certainly hope one of the lessons we're trying to learn from deep water is: is that technology safe? Is it not adaptable to deep water, or was it management issues that caused the problem? And as was as was mentioned here. What we're hearing from the Ocean of the Commission that's dealing with this issue is that there certainly were issues of mismanagement, negligence, gross negligence, as some attorneys would call it, which is important for some perspectives. And I think that's a big component. But there's real issues of making sure that we're technologically ready to move in those deep waters and respond. The, the other uh, is that uh, this is not the first. As I said, the first incident of a, of a spill in the Gulf of Mexico, in fact, 30 years ago, we had what was called ICSTA. And until deep water came along, this was the largest accidental oil spill on record. Uh, and it occurred off the Yucatan area, in Mexico, right, right about here, in relatively shallow water. But it was, and, and I actually worked on the ICSTA spill myself, along with a number of other our senior scientists at HRI, and it was eerily a similar. What happened at Ixtoc was what began to happen in deep water. We had many of the same instances. They tried the top kills of putting mud into the top of the well and trying to drive it down by pressure. They tried the uh, kill shots, uh, junk shots they call them, of uh, trying to in introduce uh, steel bearings and balls and those types of things in to stop it from that direction. They had a, a containment cap. Now, the Brits call it a top hat and the Mexicans call it a sombrero, but it was basically the, the, the same approach. So they tried all the same things, uh, and there were a lot of impacts. For example, on, uh, sea turtles was a, a big issue in, in Ixtoc. Uh, birds were affected. Shrimp, we saw uh, cutbacks in shrimp and squid uh, production over the years. Beaches were primarily affected. The Ixtoc spill was the spill that affected the western part of the Gulf of Mexico and Texas, uh, whereas deep water was mostly to the east. There was a point, this is a shoreline shot, and we'll see some more later, of the Padre Island National Seashore. 65 mile long barrier island that basically looked like a paved highway with oil that was coating it from the Ixtoc spill. 
the point about this is that once the spill was capped, within months, the studies that were all promised were going to look at this stuff, they all disappeared. Never happened. So basically, we learned over 30 years not very much about how to deal with environmental issues related to these spills. We missed an opportunity to be better prepared, and we paid that price. The other point is basically a, pol a, a energy policy with blinders on it that really had their foot on the, on the gas. When you look at concerns about the U.S., I've, uh, I've been alive through, uh, through six presidents. Every one of those presidents had an energy policy. Many, many of those policies were multifaceted, but there was always one com has always been one common component of that, and that is we have to reduce our dependence on foreign oil. Uh, and that has always come forward to, from, from all, all those, those presidents. And what that means is, if you're not going to be ten, dependent on foreign oil, where is the oil? A big part of the oil is in the Gulf of Mexico. And as the oil was developed and, and depleted in the shallow waters, we've moved offshore. And so there is real basis for that statement that said, drill, baby, drill. That's where that came from. There was huge pressure uh, from all of us, from Congress and others, to go after oil as quickly as possible, perhaps without as much attention being paid to the environmental issues and other types of things that, that we've dealt with in deep water as and again we've paid that we paid that price. So switching from what was some of the background causes of this, this problem, from mismanagement, complacency, and a huge push, a tremendous push to develop oil and gas domestically, the point point now is, okay, well, so what? In the Gulf of Mexico, what, was the, what was the impact? Why do we even care about the Gulf of Mexico? And I try to bring it into three different, different categories, basically, starting with the first, and that is, is that the Gulf of Mexico accounts for about 50% of, of liquid natural gas, 44% of crude oil production, 43% uh, <coughs> of natural gas, and, and almost half of the petroleum refining capacity is all located around the Gulf of Mexico. And all of that is connected throughout the country by a network, a circulatory system, if you will, the heart of which is the, the Gulf of Mexico. So basically, the Gulf of Mexico is the gas station of the nation. So from an economic standpoint, it's critical. Whatever happens in the Gulf, be it a hurricane or, or, or something like this, oil and ga or gas prices that you put into your car, the gasoline prices go up, and they have. <coughs> but at the same time, the Gulf of Mexico produces 1.3 billion pounds of seafood every year, one of the most productive areas in our country and in the world. The Gulf is also, you see over half of the recreational fishing activities, billions of dollars each year, occurs in the Gulf of states area itself. And this is something that my friends on the East Coast don't like to hear, but basically the Gulf of Mexico gives us more finfish, shrimp, and shellfish annually than basically all the eastern seaboard of the United States. So whenever I go to the East Coast and uh, to restaurants around the Chesapeake Bay, and of course Chesapeake Bay is, uh, is the big estuary, the, the central estuary, and many of us are, that work in other parts of the country are quite jealous of the attention that Chesapeake gets, but it's, it's a wonderful place. But if you're eating at a restaurant on the banks of the Chesapeake, there's an 80% chance that the oysters and crabs that you're eating came from the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, they don't like to admit that there, but that's the case, and, and, and that was proven up uh, when, the, as a result of the deep water spill, because you can no longer get crabs in Baltimore for a period of time when it was all closed down. So basically, the Gulf of Mexico, I think, is the sushi bar to the nation, providing much of our seafood. Perhaps not so much out here in the West Coast. You have your own brand out here, and I love it as well, but, but certainly for the rest of the country. Over 41% of the uh, continental U.S. drained in the Gulf of Mexico. Everything that happens here, agriculture, industrial development, municipal uh, discharges, all eventually can end up in the Gulf of Mexico. And one of the results of that has been the annual creation of what's called a dead zone, a toxic zone, that as these waters come out uh, of the, uh, through the Mississippi and into the Gulf, uh, they re release huge amounts of nutrients. Those nutrients are uh, consume phytoplankton blooms, these types of things, they die, they use up the oxygen and create these, these zones of, of uh, low oxygen, sometimes the size of Delaware, for example, five or 7,000 square miles, and they're occurring more frequently on an annual basis, and they're lasting longer 
because of, of, the, of that drainage of, of water. In addition, the Gulf Coast states of Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Texas make up four of the five top states responsible for the greatest surface water discharges of toxic chemicals. As I said, over 47% of the refining capacity of this country is located along the margins of, of the uh, uh, Gulf of Mexico because that's where the oil is and that's their source of, of raw materials. Uh, and this is one of the consequences of that. So I have to say from time to time that the, water, the Gulf of Mexico is a water filter and yes, sometimes the disposal of the nation. The people in the Gulf of Mexico pay a very high penalty and take huge risk. And, and I hear this from time to time when people say, well, you, so you have an oil spill down there, that's y'all's problem. You created that mess, you live in it. So you deserve what you get. I think the counter argument to that is that the people, the states around the Gulf of Mexico, do take huge risk by having those refining capacities there uh, to produce these goods. But I guarantee you that if, if you uh, drive a car, if you cool your home, you use any kind of plastic, you eat bread, beef, pork, you, uh, you put something down your drain, you like redfish, by a sea trick, you like the beef, any of those things, all those things make you, you and I, we all have a stake in the economic and ecological, ecological health of the Gulf of Mexico because of those things that take place in those Gulf states. Those, those Gulf states take a huge risk for the rest of us so we can enjoy a lifestyle that we do enjoy today. We would not be able to without that. So we all have a stake in making sure that that's, that is protected. Well, let's switch a little bit from economics and talk about the other part of the Gulf of Mexico. And this is the part that many people don't recognize because I hear often that, well, the, the, uh, the Gulf of Mexico is totally industrialized. There's, there's nothing there except oil platforms and not, not anything worth saving. Now, from time to time, I prefer to have that said because I just assume some people not come down and see what we have there. But it is a marvelous, diverse, biodiverse region. We have over half of the wetlands in the U.S., some 5 million acres, 4,000 miles of coastline. We have 90% of all the seagrass beds in the country, 100% of all the mangroves, 35% of the coral reefs. We have some of the most well-developed deep water coral communities anywhere in the world. We'll talk about those more in a moment. But it is a hugely diverse habitat, a set of habitats that occur th <clears throat> throughout the Gulf of Mexico. Our coral reefs, for example, are some of the healthiest in the world, over 50% living coral. And so there's this marvelous stage on which uh, biodiversity of the Gulf is expressed. It's one of the most biodiverse regions in the world, over 15,000 species. 71 species of sharks and rays. We're very much well known, of course, for clams and, and the mollusks, over 2,400 species. Crabs and shrimp, again, 2,600 species. 28 species of whales and dolphins. Five of turtles, and on and on and on, and on those type of things. It's a marvelously diverse place. And this is just what we know primarily about the margins of the Gulf of Mexico. We know very little about the continental shelf and the deeps, where there are depths where there are even more species. So it's a rich area. It is industrialized, but it's a marvelous balance of economic development and ecological health and biodiversity that is really worth, worth saving, worth the effort to take to make sure that it is sustained for the future. So let's take now a look at what happened with Deepwater Horizon, which is now the largest environmental incident that uh, particular oil spill that's ever occurred in this country. Uh, Ixtoc was before that, and the only thing larger than, than this one was the uh, purposeful a release during the Persian Gulf Wars uh, when, when oil was released there. But as an accident, this is the largest over 4 million uh, barrels of uh, oil uh, at a depth of 5,000 feet, 1,500 meters. This was the deepest oil spill release or release that, that has ever occurred. Uh, and they responded with 2 million gallons of dispersant to try to address it. So it was a huge issue. It was, and because of where it occurred, this is the Mississippi River, this is the margin of the continental shelf, occurred right in here, because of where it occurred, uh, it, was, it had the potential for a truly ecosystem scale, Gulf of Mexico scale incident, and we saw some of that uh, as we looked, looked toward this issue and, and dealt with it. The Gulf of Mexico, basically, Florida, Cuba, Mexico up through here, the continental shelf margins about that go down to about 600 feet, it really is a very shallow sea, about half. Uh, of the basin is in shallow, shallow tidal and continental shelf areas, 38% uh, uh, in the intertidal, 22% on the shelf. Then in the slope area, which is this area in here, from 600 feet uh, down to about 10,000 feet in different places, this is 
the shelf, that's 22%, and then you have the deep, so over 10,000 feet in our deepest part of the Gulf, about 14,000 feet. And, of course, what happens here, the, the famous uh, loop current, uh, the Gulf Stream, comes up to the Yucatan Strait, loops up into the Gulf, and this flexes back and forth, oscillates as far as where the loop occurs, back out through the Florida Straits and up the East Coast. And, of course, as the spill occurred, there was tremendous concern that this oil would be entrained into that uh, Gulf Stream and then move down off the coast of Florida and up. Uh, and that was uh, uh, a, a lot of speculation was, was made about that, of the oil actually making it all the way back to Britain and paying them back for what they did, British Petroleum did. Not very, there was never a very likelihood of that. In fact, it uh, does appear that it was the loop current that probably minimized much of the potential damage from the spill. Because what happened was this loop current, as it comes in through here, will on a regular basis break off, this loop will break off and form a little gyre, a little bubble of water that will drift across this way. And so as that, that happened this year, the current sharpened up and actually as the loop current was moving in this direction, it kept the oil up in this area and didn't allow it to spread. So there was a very conscious effort by the response agencies, EPA, NOAA, and the Coast Guard, they had to make a decision of what, what, were, the most, what were the highest priorities for protection. And as I said earlier, over 50% of the wetlands in the U.S. are located uh, in Louisiana, uh, primarily Louisiana and Mississippi. And so there was a decision made that what we had to protect at all costs the shallow coastal margins of the Gulf of Mexico, primarily those wetlands. We didn't want that oil to get into those wetlands. And so there was uh, a use of... Uh, uh, huge uses of aerial applications of dispersants, uh, more than any place else, 2 million uh, gallons. This is the more, more, a greater use of dispersants than occurred in any other uh, situation. Uh, they even injected dispersants right at the wellhead, which is something that they've never done before because it's of course, almost a mile down. But they did do that there. Uh, they used um, know, thousands and thousands of miles of booms and a huge burning a campaign to try to burn oil around the, around the spill sites. They did all that they could to try to keep the oil out of those continental margins. And to a great degree, they were successful. The oil never really penetrated up into those wetlands to the degree that many of us felt it could have done. It stayed primarily on the margins. The problem, of course, was that in exchange for deflecting the oil out of these areas, the oil didn't disappear. It had to go someplace. So basically what happened was, and it's, it appears, is that they transferred the impact uh, of the oil to the deeper part of the Gulf. This is, this of course, is, the, uh, this is Florida going off this way. Uh, these are the continental shelf margins here. And this area is a close-up, which is called the Soto Canyon, a very prominent feature like a Grand, Can like a Grand Canyon underwater, where uh, it has a tremendous upwelling system as deep water, nutrient-rich nutrient -rich <coughs> deep waters from the Gulf moves from here up onto the Florida shelf and down the shelf. So these margins and these walls are tremendously productive uh, of, uh, with animals, plankton blooms, and those types of things, oil spill being, being right here. And this is where we're now looking for the potential impact of the spill. Right now we have um, two vessels uh, our, our, that we're coordinating with, uh, HRI. We're smart enough not to own oceanographic vessels because <laughs> they're very expensive to own, but we do lease them. And we're doing the benthic surveys now, and we've been running concentric patterns for the past months, going further and further out from the oil spill, taking samples all along the bottom and analyzing those for impact. We're in the process of doing that right now to try to determine, determine those impacts. We do have concerns in that open ocean system. Whale sharks, for example, whale sharks are uh, you know, the largest uh, fish. Uh, and during uh, the spill, uh, there is an area about here that's called Ewing Bank, and, and it's a submerged uh, feature that doesn't come within about 500 feet of the surface, but it does come up off the bottom there. And for some reason, whale sharks really love that area. It has, probably has something to do with the, with the food that's there. But uh, we had uh, one of our vessels out there, and we were flying at the same time, and in one photograph, uh, we saw 90 whale sharks uh, in one, one sector, or probably 200 out there at the time the largest of which was about 30 foot long, which is about the width of this, uh, of this auditorium. They are filter feeders. 
And the disturbing thing we saw at the time was that there were, and there were oil patches of oil floating in that area. And they, these, uh, these whale sharks swim along the surface with their mouth open just like that. They take the plankton in and filter it out. And they were just doing just like the skimmers were. Uh, they were skimming up oil as they went and didn't seem to notice that that's what they were doing. And had, didn't deflect them from their courses. They continued through it. We don't know what the impact of uh, the spill will be on, on, uh, on whale sharks, but we're very concerned about that. The other uh, phenomenon that occurs here, as other places in the world, is one of the largest migrations that occur on a regular basis is the deep scattering layer. Uh, these are organisms, fish, other plankton, those types of things that, that move up and down in the water column uh, at night. They rise to the surface, tremendous source of, of food uh, for uh, all types of animals, including uh, uh, whales, of course. And uh, these organisms were moving up through a water column that, had, that contained large quantities of well-dispersed oil. So the question and concern is, is what was happening to these organisms as they passed through this oil? And we're still uh, looking at that issue. There are, um, in the area of, one, one of the things that we talked about earlier, I talked about earlier that, that the uh, uh, Mississippi, the nutrients coming out of the Mississippi does create dead zone areas out there, but that's only when it's and there's an open abundance of nutrients coming out of the Mississippi primarily from agricultural development in the Midwest. But at other times, it is a tremendous source of nutrients, a food source for the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and it is one of the most marvelous places in the world, off in this deeper area, deeper water area, off the Mississippi to go because of the abundance of life there. Huge plankton blooms which attract all types of organisms. Uh, we have our own uh, population. A sperm whales, about 1,400 sperm whales that occur nowhere else in the world except here. They stay here all the time. They're slightly smaller than, than the, uh, the Atlantic sperm whales, which kind of bothers us in Texas. We always like things to be bigger, but these are a little smaller and they are unique. Uh, we have, uh, and they feed on giant squid that, that swarm around or swim around in the bottoms of, of these deeps, of these deep areas. And so we have this marvelous uh, ecosystem there uh, that is right in this area of the spill. Unfortunately, the spill and the oil development there is, it was right in the middle of one of our uh, most biodiverse, richly productive areas in the Gulf of Mexico. Another species that we're very concerned about, bluefin tuna. The Atlantic bluefin tuna have two different populations. Uh, one population spawns in the Mediterranean. The other population comes around into the Gulf and spawns only in the Gulf. And un un unlike some species of tuna, which can move around and spawn at different points, the bluefin tuna spawns only in one place. And you can probably guess where that one place is, which is exactly where the Deepwater Horizon oil spill occurred. And the pot, this, this species of tuna, like all tuna, but particularly Atlantic, are grossly overfished. About 80 to 90 percent of their population is already gone because of that. So our concern is if there's one group of organisms, one population of organisms that could take a basically a fatal hit, this would be this would be the, the population because of the stress that's already on it. We will not know this until next year. We're keeping our fingers crossed. But that's all we can do is just keep our fingers crossed to see what that impact might be. Now, I've talked mostly about organisms in the, in the uh, surface of the water column, but as I said uh, earlier, <laughs> these kind of little shelf margins where there's these upwellings, this is DeSoto Canyon again, these canyons are lined with Organisms that live on the bottom, live on benthic organisms that live in the mud and, and live on the margins of these canyon walls. And they're tremendously well developed. Here's a, a, one of our survey works along this area where we found different communities of, of organisms. And these communities are quite complex. They're really bizarre. These tube worms, for example, they actually drill for oil. Because what you have to understand, in the Gulf of Mexico, there are natural oil seeps that have been going on for millions of years. About two million barrels of oil a year naturally escape from the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico. And have been doing so since the formation of the Gulf. These organisms, like this, have actually evolved to use that as an energy source. And it's a food source for them. But of course, like any food, like you're not eating a, a protein shake or something like that, we might like it, but we're not going to be able to live in it. And so that's our concern, is what was happening to these potential plumes of oil that were coming out of the bottom of the spill. Because what happens there, and this is a unique feature about these types of oil spills, 
And you can think of it very much like a spray can of, of anything, any kind of aerosol can, exactly what was happening. As the oil came out of the, uh, out of the, the uh, bottom from the well, uh, it was about 40% methane. Now, most oil is about 10 to 15% methane, but this reservoir contains 40% methane, which is just like the propellant in the spray can. And when you spray something, like a can of spray starch, and you see the little droplets of uh, uh, atomized uh, liquid floating through the air, that's what was happening here, is that they were creating these plumes of oil. Sometimes, some people felt hundreds of miles long, certainly 20 and 30 miles long, and these plumes of oil drifting off in the bottom, uh, not degrading as, as we had hoped, but moving into these canyon wall situations. That's what we were concerned about. And the impact on something, whoops, this way, what I hit there. Um, these are solitary coral, coral communities. They're not like coral reefs, if you see, but they're, they're uh, like bush-like type of things, organisms, that, are, that occur in the Gulf. They're very long lives. When they were about the size of my hand, they were the size of my hand 2,000 years ago. Today, after 2,000 years, they're about like this, big bushes, and there's whole forests of these uh, aligning these canyon walls, so very long lives, uh, but also particularly susceptible because they've never uh, been subjected and made much change. At that depth where they are, conditions don't change a lot. So our concern is and has been uh, what would be the impact of, uh, of oil plumes sweeping along the continents, <coughs> and we we're, we're remain concerned about it. And there's been a lot of work uh, now going on to try to figure it out. Let me go back one more time on this. So there, a big part of the research that's going on today, besides the benthic work we're talking about, are surveys of these coral communities. In fact, right now, the Alvin out of Woods Hole, which is our only, our deepest diving, a submersible, is in the Gulf and doing surveys uh, <coughs> along this area. And they've also been out to the actual spill site and gone down and looked at the bottoms there, and they're seeing some oil there. Uh, in two weeks, my own uh, institute uh, will uh, take, uh, have a, take an expedition out along through here using a two-person submersible. We hope to team up with the Alvin somewhere in this area to do some dives together. Our job, our task will be to assess the uh, deep water coral communities along this margin. We've done, we did this work, uh, did surveys out there about three to four years ago. So we have good background data in which to compare and, and to try to assess that potential damage. So hopefully sometime, like today, about this time in two weeks, I hope to be about 1,500 feet under the water looking around uh, at, uh, at, at corals and hopefully I'm going to be looking at healthy coral communities. Well, let's move on and talk a little bit about now to the, the next topic is will the Gulf of Mexico uh, uh, recover? So in case you have dinner plans, you can just do it right now and say yes. So you, can, you can go ahead and go to dinner now and you're, it's done if you feel better about it. But yes, it will. It is going to recover. It is an amazingly, amazingly resilient body of water. And I think, I try to think of the analogy of when people ask me, will it recover? How do we know what, where, where is the Gulf right now? I think the analogy of a concussion, that the Gulf of Mexico has undergone a pretty severe concussion, is not a bad analogy. It's certainly been one that's been in the news uh, over the last uh, a year with football and those types of issues. And I think it's very, we're thinking about something very similar. The Gulf of Mexico has taken uh, some pretty severe hits to the head. Uh, Ixtox Bill, for example. Here's one of these things I was talking about. This is Padre Island National Seashore. It's the longest undeveloped uh, coastal margin, uh, margin, barrier island in the world, I think. Uh, and back in 1970, it was basically a paved road for the entire 65 miles uh, of uh, oil which has since has, has recovered. But we've taken those kinds of hits, and we have come back. The question is, is how, uh, how long, at just as a concussion, how many hits in the head can you take and recover from before you start doing permanent damage, long-term damage? <clears throat> and, that's, and that's what we're in the middle of trying to assess now. Is there some long-term impacts uh, from oil spills that will uh, Cause us concern down the future in the future as we're dealing with the real issues that are going to affect the future of the Gulf of Mexico. I'll give me a <coughs> glass of water here before I lose my voice entirely. Should have done that earlier, so I'm sorry, I apologize. <coughs> This 
This is um, one of our research vessels. I'll keep it all one. This is one of our research vessels as, as they're out now taking these benthic samples and our crew that's working uh, take these samples up. It's been an interesting <coughs> experience as we bring these cores up. We're, uh, <coughs> we're finding some oil in the cores. Of course, we have to do further chemical analysis to make sure that we're not finding a lot of oil in them. But one thing that we are finding a lot of uh, in, in some of these cores is ash. Uh, from the burnings, they've burned lots of this oil on the surface. It's been kind of amazing to me to see that where these burn, uh, burns occurred near the, uh, near the spill site, that this ash came on that rain down onto the bottom. We're actually finding it in, in our cores. So let's take a look at uh, uh, briefly at where we are in this recovery phase from, from our concussion. Uh, as I said earlier, there was a lot of effort uh, taken to try to keep the uh, impact of the oil from the coastal and wetland margins. Uh, and in doing so, when we look at that, I think what we'll see is a pretty full recovery of any impact from that oil spill on beaches particularly, because those are very uh, resilient areas. They recover very quickly. We'll see those impacts, whatever they are, disappear within the next two years. We'll probably have a few tar balls and those types of things that will continue to stir up with storms, but those are relatively easy to, to deal with. When you look at the impact of oil on the biota, a fin fish very quickly can metabolize oil that, they're, that, that they have to deal with and, and move it out of the system, convert it to food, basically, if you will, and deal with it, shrimp or necks, crabs. Oysters may be the longest impacted um, uh, invertebrate or coastal uh, margin community uh, because they, they retain these oil longer, but I think it's still within the next several years. Well, if there's any impacts, that will disappear. The wetlands. What it looks like now, and again, it will take next growing season before we can figure this for sure, uh, but it looks like the oil only penetrated the margins of these wetland areas and didn't get into the interior wetlands of where they could be very harmful, and this is good news. The fact is that the efforts to protect the wetlands and to get oil out of those wetlands where it did occur probably have caused more harm than just leaving the oil alone. This is a lesson we never learned from any oil spill, because there's just strong desire from those in charge of recovery when they see oil in these wetland areas, is to go in and do something to get it out. But by the time the oil reaches these wetlands, it's already too late. The best advice, the best approach is to leave it and let the natural processes take care of that oil uh, if, it, if it's going to. And so in many cases here and others, what we see is efforts to, uh, to do uh, restoration work or to come in and recover the oil that's far more damage than leaving alone at that point. It's far better to prevent problems than to deal with them in that way. Now some of these impacts we really won't know for even beyond the two to five years, and that's the impacts in the open ocean uh, systems. Uh, some of these, for example, uh, mammals like a sperm whale. We know for sure we lost two sperm whale during this event, one uh, uh, semi-adult and one juvenile. Uh, when you're dealing with a small population that we're talking of long lived organisms, or animals like whales, even if you have 1,500 of them, the loss of even one or two that can be very serious. And so that's a, that's a concern we have. We hope that, if, that all we lost were those two of that 1,400. We don't know for sure yet. Uh, but we're, we're obviously going to have to check on those. So they are of concern. Turtles. Uh, there are five species of turtles in the Gulf, one in particular called Kent Ridley. Uh, occur the, the endangered uh, species. Uh, they, we don't know exactly uh, what the impact may be, but we're sure, we, we feel very confident that there were pretty severe impacts on turtles. It will set the recovery back uh, a number of years. Uh, there was an effort to move turtle eggs uh, that were in, uh, buried in the beaches, to move them to other places, dig them up and move them. Uh, this was tried in Ixtoc. A number of us tried to get that information to the Fish and Wildlife Service that was doing this uh, activity to tell them about that because the uh, actions in Ipstock to move turtle eggs was a total failure. Every one of those turtles, never, none of those turtles ever came back. We never saw any turtles from it. It was a complete loss. Uh, and I'm, before, I'm afraid in this case it will be the same. So we think we're going to see some impacts uh, on turtles. We don't know. Uh, again, we're looking at the, the benthic fauna. As I spent some time on talking earlier, we're assessing that right now. Uh, it's been a mixed bag. There have been several expeditions out to look at the, at the benthos, both the deepwater corals and others, and the results have been mixed. In some places in the Soto Canyon, they have found a, a great deal of oil and others not. Uh, so it's a big ocean. 
Uh, and so it's very difficult to put together a, a complete picture with so little data. So again, we'll just have to take a look as we move forward and, and sample and, and get, a, get a better picture. Deepwater corals, uh, at least some of the initial results are seeming to indicate that they may have not been impact, impacted as much as we thought. We're getting to look at it. We're, we're feeling better about that because of some of the work that Alvin has done in the last uh, several weeks plus some other expeditions that have been out there. We hope to do some more confirming work on that in the next several weeks. I already talked about bluefin tuna. We think that species will very likely take a, a, a severe hit. Harpin. Harpin is another uh, species of fish. They do not spawn uh, in this area, fortunately. They spawn uh, in Cuba and off of Florida and down in Mexico, but the adults from this area swim here, and from Florida and Cuba swim here, and they, the big adults, which can be reach lengths of five to seven, six and a half feet, probably 70 to 80 years old by that time, uh, because of the productivity, they feed heavily in here. Uh, and we don't know the impact on those adults. It may take some time before we, we do know that if, if we've lost a significant part of our, of our adult carpet population, which are the ones that obviously produce the, the, the next generation. So we're concerned about it. We just don't know much about them yet. The whale sharks. Again, I said we, we're very concerned about those whale sharks because of behavior that they exhibited during the oil spill and their feeding. Unfortunately, when whale sharks die, they sink. Uh, and so, again, there's no way to assess carcass or, or to do aerials or those types of things. They do uh, uh, farm up. They, they're, they're about now. Uh, the bulk of the, the, the uh, whale shark are probably moving uh, south. They seem to congregate in areas like this. And so we, we managed, while we were out there, we managed to satellite tag a number of these uh, whale sharks, and so we're tracking them. Uh, to see where they're, and we'll get the tags will be coming off probably in the next month, uh, hopefully. They, they're set to release on six months uh, and then come to surface. And what these little satellite tags do is they collect data for that period of time. When they come off, they beam the uh, data to the satellite and download them as an email, basically, uh, to our computers. And we, they can interpret that data and, and track them and see where they're going. So we'll be watching them very closely. So there are a lot of questions we have left about the impact of this oil spill and other situations on the Gulf of Mexico. But basically, uh, I want to, to leave, you, or leave this point is that the Gulf of Mexico is a very resilient body of water. It's fascinating in that regard. Uh, and I want to talk for a few minutes about why it's that way. And one of the reasons uh, is this. It has this natural variability. The conditions that we see in the Gulf of Mexico, you can have extremely hot summers. You'd be followed by droughts, the northers, hurricanes, all these types of things occur that change the, the conditions in the Gulf of Mexico very rapidly. As I, as I mentioned to you earlier, it's about half of the, half of the uh, Gulf of Mexico is very sh relatively shallow water, so it's subject to climatic changes that we see. So there's a broad variability that occurs in the Gulf, and the Gulf's biota, the biodiversity, is really readily adapted to that variability. So if there's a man-made impact, like an oil spill or something like that, as long as it's within that natural variability, it has the capacity to deal with it. The Gulf of Mexico is located between temperate areas and tropics, so it has elements of both. So that depending on what condition or what situation may occur, one of the other components of that fauna can step in and cover the first off, basically. So it has that, that uh, ability to, in that regard. As I said, over 40% of the country drains in the Gulf of Mexico at different times. That can be a real problem, of course, when there's too much nutrient. But actually, it's a huge nutrient source that can feed that system and keep it, keep it fueled and help keep, the, keep it healthy uh, as it moves along. And because the, of the in complex interconnectivity of the Gulf of Mexico, currents moving, these are, these are currents, uh, these are little devices you drop in the water and trace currents as it, as it drifts along. And you can see they go everywhere. So the Gulf of Mexico is a really well mixed body of water, so whatever happens in one part or the other can, can move very quickly. This works as well for, uh, for spawning and this type of thing, because animals that occur there, are the types like the shrimps and the crabs, they typically are, have a reproductive strategy where they produce huge numbers of offspring. Uh, and whatever the environmental conditions are, uh, they can, if they're favorable, they can take, it, take advantage of them. And if, if the conditions are unfavorable and the populations are reduced slowly, they can quickly recover. 
And once they recover, uh, they can make use of this system to spread and, and, and uh, return and restore areas where there has been tremendous hits and loss to biodiversity. So what may happen <coughs> in the Gulf of Mexico, what happened in Ixtoc is that they saw a 60 to 70 percent reduction in shrimp and squid production there. They have squid, we have uh, in the south, we have crabs in the north. Uh, they saw that reduction because uh, of the impact on, on spawning. But in fact, there's a huge area here, particularly in Texas, that was unaffected by any oil. So it may be that the productivity of these areas are such that it can fill any potential voids here. We'll find that out next year. Otherwise, we'll see some reduction in shrimp and crabs. But there's some folks who are saying, no, you won't see that at all. The Gulf is so resilient, so productive, that it will fill in behind this, and you'll never notice it. So it's going to be a giant experiment to, to see exactly what happens. The other uh, factor is that the Gulf of Mexico is naturally inoculated against oil spills. As I said, there's almost two million barrels of oil that naturally escape the Gulf floors every year. And that's been happening for millions of years, and there is a really robust and healthy microbial community that has evolved to take advantage of that as a food source. And what we found out during this oil spill is we knew that these types of microbes existed in the shallow waters, <clears throat> and, but we didn't know that they, that they were so abundant in the, the deeper, colder waters, and the fact that they're very metabolically active even in those cold conditions, so that these microbes are eating oil even in the deep water. So this is one thing that's helped break this oil down, we hope, and, and have seen in different places, uh, so that as oil is released, has been released, these microbes, microbial communities have really uh, taken off and using it as a food source. So we're, we're inoculated against oil spills to some degree. So what, what does all this mean? What does this oil spill mean in the, in the scale of things altogether? And what I would tell you is that this oil spill basically is horrendous as it was at the time and of great concern that on the scale of issues that are going to affect the future of the Gulf of Mexico, it's a relatively small event. It certainly has brought attention to the Gulf of Mexico, which is what we, we need, and these type of events are of concern when they, when they uh, have an impact that exacerbates or that adds to the real drivers of environmental uh, conditions in the Gulf, and these things are habitat loss, nutrient over enrichment, overfishing, and climate change. These are the issues that will determine the future of the Gulf of Mexico, not necessarily this oil spill, may contribute to it to some degree, but these are the big issues that we need to take a look at, and I'll take a few minutes just to illustrate a few of those. Uh, as I said, uh, there's a, the habitats of the Gulf of Mexico are very diverse. Uh, over half of our wetlands in the country occur here, but we've already lost half of that. Even though we have half the wetlands in the country, half of those have already disappeared. Seagrass beds, We've lost 12 to 66 percent of seagrasses in the Gulf of Mexico in some areas, like Galveston Bay, Texas, 90 percent of the seagrasses disappeared. Mangroves, 25 to 33 percent, and in some places 86 percent of that is, has disappeared. All these things being due to channelization, drainage, development, all these types of activities that go on in a, in a, in a place where the population is growing uh, at a tremendous rate. Uh, this is, of course, critical because 95% of all the commercial and recreationally important fish and shellfish uh, depend on these wetlands and seagrasses and mangroves for some part of their, their life. So these habitats are important from that perspective. Uh, for example, as we're sitting here talking tonight, an area about the size of the whole compound of the Shedd Aquarium in Louisiana has basically uh, an area of wetlands about the size of this compound not just this building, but everything around it, has disappeared, turned, converted into open water. That's the, ra the rate of wetlands loss that we're seeing there. And when, when you have that kind of rate of loss, and it, it's so important to the country, these are issues that are going to determine the future of the health of that ecosystem that we really have to deal with. It has nothing to do with this oil spill. It certainly has something to do with oil development, because a part of this uh, problem came from the channelization, driving channels through these wetlands to access oil areas. The biggest component of this, though, came from the levying of the Mississippi River, putting levees along the margins of the Mississippi to prevent flooding and directing the Mississippi out directly into the Gulf so that the, so that the sediments that come down the Mississippi are no longer building these, these wetlands up 
and these wetlands are drowning. One other issue to talk about is climate change, the 800-pound gorilla in the room as far as we're concerned in the Gulf of Mexico. All the issues uh, that we see is sea level rise, temperature increases, habitat changes, invasive species, ocean acidification are particularly of concern in the Gulf of Mexico because it is basically a shallow subtropical sea. Over half the bottom is in shallow areas. The margins, if we see an elevation, that we have very uh, low-lying marginal areas where elevation, we talk about elevations in the term of inches, uh, going miles inland type of thing. So any changes in sea levels has a tremendous effect. So the issues of climate change will probably be seen first for the continental U.S. within the Gulf of Mexico, and we're seeing that now. Uh, my own data, I have 30 years worth of data on temperatures in the Gulf of Mexico that, that we've collected over that period of time. And what we're seeing is that the summer temperatures are not getting necessarily any warmer. I'm talking about water temperatures. The, surf, the water temperatures in the Gulf of Mexico are not getting any warmer during the summer. That's, they're just normally variable. But what we're seeing is the winter temperatures have been increasingly warming over that period of time that exactly traces what we see in, in other documents and data about global temperature rises. It's on the exact perfect path. And we're seeing that, that temperature steadily uh, increase every winter. And we're, as a result, we're seeing many new species coming into our area and that type of thing. So that, that, all those things are happening. And so this is, will be the big concern for us is, in, in the Gulf is, is climate change will be an important issue. So the Gulf of Mexico really is, is a place, as I started out with, is a place where we see this contrast between a healthy economy and a, and a healthy environment. And they, they, they coexist together in the Gulf of Mexico. I think that's the great lesson to be learned. Sometimes they continue with one another, as it happened in the oil spill, in the deep water oil spill. So it's a mix of things. But, but these are the lessons we have to learn how to make these things work together, how to deal with them together, particularly in the Gulf of Mexico for the future. Uh, and I use, for example, uh, of how this happens, the Flower Gardens National Marine Sanctuary is the northernmost coral reef in the, in the uh, continental U.S. And we just finished a survey of the Flower Gardens uh, a few years ago, or last year. It has over 50% living coral. It's healthier than any other reef in the, in the Gulf of Mexico or the Caribbean, and this is including Florida, where you see areas of 25, maybe 25 or 30% living coral are considered healthy. So this is the healthiest coral reef that we have, yet at the same time, this coral reef is entirely surrounded by oil and gas platforms and pipelines all around it, uh, but they can coexist if they're done, done correctly, and that's what we have to learn uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. Because the Gulf, as I said, is, is a resilient body of water, uh, we know, uh, we have in our hands now, we have the management and the policy framework with which to invoke or, and to take uh, management steps that can work across the Gulf as a whole. We have a lot to know about science. There's a lot of questions we need to know about the science, what we know about the Gulf, both biology, <coughs> biological, chemical, and, and geological. There's a lot of information left, but we do have, already have sufficient knowledge to make sound management decisions. We have those in our, in our hands. So we're all set there. We have those tools with which to make sure that we have a Gulf of Mexico that is both economically and ecologically healthy. The question that is in front of us really is, do we have the political will, all of us sitting here in this audience, does this country, the people around the Gulf, have the political will to make all of that happen? That's a question that I can't answer as a scientist and a manager. It's a question only that you and all of us together as a whole can make a decision. Are we willing to take those steps to do so? And that's what I hope that we will do for the future, not only of the Gulf of Mexico, but the, but the coast of California and the East Coast, we all have similar issues that we're going to have to deal with. Hopefully we can learn from our mistakes because we really don't have any choice. Uh, if, we, if we're going to have uh, an uh, ocean, ocean ecosystem or coastal waters that we all want to leave for our future generations uh, to enjoy and to benefit from. So I appreciate you all, uh, your attention tonight, and uh, I think we probably have some time questions. We have time for questions. Who has the first one? Um, when you were talking about how we would, or 
they burned the oil off of the ocean. Were there any like side effects to the environment in that respect? Like, did that pollute the air or anything, or was it kind of like yeah. not, ne not ne necessary? Yeah. The question, question was the question is that the because it's we actually they burned more oil in this situation than they ever had in any other place. You saw these huge plumes of oil, which of course the spill occurred and the, and the burning occurred 40 miles offshore. And standing on the on the Mobile Bay, we could see those plumes from there. So the question is, was there any impact there? And yes, they were. Uh, they, could, they we did take those. In fact, uh, they had to uh, change their pattern of burning uh, and times depending on the wind direction because of the water air quality issues coming into shore and the concern of what might be in that air. And there's still some concerns that uh, that there is impact from that. So that was a that was a, a, a very great concern uh, all along. And we were told a couple of weeks ago in this auditorium by uh, the, the, the carrier from the Coast Guard, who was the incident commander, that the amount of oil burned in the Gulf exceeded the total volume of oil spilled by Exxon Valdez. I didn't, yeah. Those are amazing statistics. Wow. Yeah. Who, has, who has the next one? Someone has to have, of course. Hi. Uh, my name is Barbara Wiseman, and I work with an organization called the Earth Organization, and we've been operating down in the Gulf for the last several months trying to uh, find some solutions uh, to actually cleaning up the water, and, and have done that. Um, and we just finished producing a TV program, which will be coming out uh, this next week. But I'm, I'm, there's a particular, there's several questions that I have, and, and uh, but one of them is that I continue to hear and um, don't know if there's any valid data on this, that there was so much damage to the seabed floor that uh, because of the spill and because of the, the way that the, uh, the pipeline was handled or the, you know, the, the equipment was handled, that there are, um, that it caused other vents to uh, start gushing and that there are several of them now that are gushing enormous amounts of oil in an uncontrolled fashion. And that because of that, they're still spraying the Corexit. Um, we have we have uh, firsthand reports of, of people actually being sprayed in the middle of the night, uh, fishermen out on their boats and being sprayed in the middle of the night with this stuff. So, are, do you have any data related to that? Mm, uh, no, I, unfortunately, I, I don't. I've heard some of those those the stories, uh, and uh, but and not not be able to verify it in, in any way. We've had we have shipped out there now two of them. Uh, and uh, but they may be far enough offshore that they're not involved in it. But I, we're not aware of it because we're sampling in the whole bottom around there. We're not seeing anything like that. Not to say they're not doing something else with the corrected and spring, but I have not heard that. That's, that's news to me. Sorry. <coughs> Other questions or comments? I'm going back in then. It's your next, Larry. I was just curious. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> because. The disaster in New Orleans, we saw that kind of once the media and the television stopped, you know, keeping their eye on the disaster, a lot of the help went away. Um, it didn't stop completely, but people kind of stopped paying attention. Are we looking at that same problem here? Like if, if the media kind of goes away from this, it happened, we're moving on, that we're going to face the same kind of problems getting help with the situation? Uh, to some degree, I think so, yes. I think that that's what happened because it, it, as soon as the thing was capped primarily and the next story came along, everyone raced off, off of that. And the big part of the uh, of the work is still still to be done and to be assessed. So there's some concern of that, although uh, some things are, are happening. There there are uh, funds being set aside. I have, we have one uh, set of money that for research and National Science Foundation and and and, uh, and in reality, uh, BP put up five hundred million dollars and it's has uh, given that money to uh, to the Gulf Alliance uh, and walked and basically you'll, you'll deal with it. That type of thing. So I think there's some money there to deal with those types of things. So one thing that seems to have happened now is that some of those monies that, for example, disappeared after Ipstock and others are still there. But the, the issue is, it's such a huge area. The Gulf, the Gulf states are so big, I think it's, it's not, uh, it's very difficult to get a handle on it. So I'm not, I think it, it, it's, the work is still obviously going on. Uh, but it's difficult to track once the media attention has gone away, certainly some of that has happened. I'm not, you're right. Have you uh, looked into whether or not the organisms are preferentially eating the lighter hydrocarbons than the heavier ones, uh, metabolizing them? 
And, and this is, uh, of course, what happens in these oil spills is that uh, they begin, uh, as soon as oil uh, is released, uh, there are some of the lighter fractions of it, uh, some of the more dangerous types actually begin to, uh, to, dis you know, to uh, separate out from, from the uh, asphaltines and those types of things. Uh, and I, I don't, there were some work done early on to look at, the, at that, that lighter fraction, but not a lot. So what we're left with, that, that is gone now. The only thing that's left are the, are the heavier asphalt teams and those types of things. That's all we really have to take a look at. The best indication we can get is, is what may have happened in the benthos, and we're taking those samples now. That part of that work is now being analyzed. We're trying to look at what's in that, all those oils that we are finding. So we're pretty sure it's obviously the heavier stuff. But, but what happens at you know, a mile underwater, we don't know a lot about. And so that's, it's a learning experience. And so that's, we're trying to figure it out. Nobody knows. I'm talking circles around you, but that's just the reality of it. I'm trying to get, tell you what we, what we do and don't know, going around circles and say all that we do and not know, but it's, uh, this is something we're going to learn from this that we have. So, Larry, after Itzhak and even after Exxon Valdez, the, the funds for assessing the environmental biological impacts, those funds went away. We were also told in the forum that we had that after Itzhak and after Exxon Valdez, the interest in preventing further releases or to respond to cleanup, there was no, no effort made at all. So the Coast Guard people told us that we, our ability to respond following a spill after Exxon Valdez virtually was unchanged up until the time of Deepwater Horizon. Is that? And before that, 30 years before that, it stopped. 30 years before. Uh, so it's, 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 it's unfathomable. It's, it's that we follow the same course. For this area, we seem not to be able to learn from our mistakes. And if not, in fact, my institute, uh, uh, my, my assistant director, Wes Tunnel, was the chief NOAA scientist for if uh, And as this was going on, we were going back and digging back all the old studies that were partially done. There was a, many promises made uh, of follow-up studies there. As soon as the well was capped, that money disappeared. Uh, same thing, and uh, Valdez is a little different. They took it all to court, and it took them 20 years to get the water out, out there. Uh, so we have not learned those those lessons. So we're trying to make the best effort we can out of this one and not let that happen again. And so we put tremendous pressure, for example, on BP, who pledged the $500 million, which is $50 million a year for 10 years for basic research, uh, to get that money out of them now and put it into the hands of an independent party that will manage it and make sure that that happens. Next question or comment? Here and then back there. Uh, you also mentioned that there was a uh, tremendous amount of methane being released from the spill, and methane being a uh, huge greenhouse gas. Do you have um, any comment on that? There are uh, two scientists that I'm aware of that are studying this, and this was an unusual thing. Not me, they didn't get a lot of attention. It was probably one of the, one of the unique aspects of this spill, as I said, most of these crude oil reservoirs in the Gulf have perhaps 10 to 20 percent, some number like that of methane. I really don't know if it's in that low level. This was 40 percent methane, a huge amount of, of methane, and it was spewed out into the water column, and it's still there to some extent. And so the question is, what will happen to that methane? Will it be somehow consumed or, or converted, or will it eventually release? And it, it, is, it, it is a serious issue. So that, that is a question that two, sci two scientists I know of uh, that are, are putting a lot of effort into to understanding exactly what that will be, because there, there could be some very serious consequences from it. We just don't know. We have one. Yes. Um, you mentioned that there were high amounts of um, dispersants that were used in this one, that were, there was so much more than in previous oil spills. And I was just wondering, I, I personally don't know what a dispersant is. I was wondering what exactly they did and if they have some sort of like negative impact on the environment or you know, what happened with that? Right. Uh, they used 2 million gallons of dispersant, which is about twice that they used in the other or the spill. Dispersant, basically, for a lack of everything, is basically soap. Yeah. has the same effect. When you drop a, a drop, you have an oil on, on water, you drop something, it, it, it suddenly disperses that. It's more, a little more complicated, but really that, that's what it is. The whole idea is to take that oil and disperse it into smaller droplets. Therefore, it can break down more quickly and more readily available to bacteria and those types of things. The concern with uh, with the uh, dispersants, the, the, the uh, commercially available dispersants, correct it was the main one they used here, is that there's some ingredients in that that they would not uh, would not tell anybody what they were, which was uh, this was a really uh, point of great concern and uh, for a lot of us, 
even EPA couldn't get them to tell what it was, but they were still using it. And so uh, we do we did see uh, in the la in weeks after the spill in some of the crab larvae. These are the small uh, larvae that eventually go into the blue crab and those type of things. These are in the plankton that uh, corrects it parts of corrected were detected in some of those larval concerns. They, the, the assessment from EPA is, uh, was that they corrected, the dispersants were no more uh, toxic than the oil. Uh, they were e e about the same uh, it, at very low level at that. That was all based on laboratory tests of, of, on particular animals. The uh, concerns were that, that, that the field situations are always different. Uh, these are different organisms out there. Uh, and there was uh, some uh, pretty good evidence by a group of scientists that when you combine oil and, and the dispersants, they were more toxic. Uh, again, we don't know for sure. That's being looked at now. National Science Foundation 10 years ago, in fact, your point, 10 years ago, uh, after Valdez even, uh, recognized that, uh, that they needed to know more about dispersants. They recommended a research program to, to examine this so that when this thing occurred again, we would have a better uh, understanding of the types of dispersants that we could use safely. Uh, that program, uh, instead of getting the $10 million a year, it was supposed to get, it got about two, and we never got those answers. So the EPA was forced into a situation, as they said themselves, of doing a giant science experiment of using these dispersants in the hopes of keeping it off, uh, keeping it away from the shores uh, of the wetlands. Uh, they have been testing seafood. Uh, more very vigorously, and they're not really finding any indication of this now. So if this was there early on, it has been metabolized, and it should be out of the system. Long answer, but that's kind of where we are. Next question or comment? Yes. So it seems like the technology to drill in deep water really isn't there yet. So is this going to happen again? Or are there any laws or legislation in place so that we don't see this again? Well, I'm not so sure the technology is not there. I think there clearly could be improved. We don't, we don't know. I think the, the consensus seems to be that the, prompt, that the issue here was mismanagement or lack of management of, of what was done. But clearly, we're pushing the limits of the available technology now uh, when we're going down to 10,000 feet and that type of thing. A part of this uh, research effort that's going on, will be going on in the next several years, will be to look at that technology very closely. Uh, to make sure that, that it, it, uh, it uh, is, is safe to use. Uh, as far as drilling, I, I, I use this analogy. I mean, it's all of us, you know, we all uh, can have our own opinion of whether you should drill offshore or not. I mean, that's, that's we, we all can't, we should have those opinions. And we deserve it. But what we can't have is our own set of facts. We have our own opinions, we can't have our own set of facts. And unless we're willing to make significant changes in our lifestyles, in other words, all ride buses, Perhaps not won't eat our houses or cool them right now. And no matter how fast we move to alternate sources, which we should do, we can move as fast as we wish we can, we're going to be dependent on oil uh, for, our, for our lifetimes. And so we're going to have to figure out some way in the interim to make sure that we can secure that oil, maintain our lifestyle as, as we want, and do it environmentally safely. We, have no, we must do that. And unfortunately, our track record uh, is not very good at it. In the past, and so our the, one of the big this is the opportunity to make that change to, to do that. I think we can do it, uh, but it's going to take real effort. One of the other questions that came up in the forum that we had was whether we needed more federal regulations, and the answer was a resounding no. We don't enforce the ones that we have, so why don't we enforce the ones that we have, and uh, it would go a long way. And this was the interesting comparison with California and the staffing levels that California have for offshore oil and the rigorous third-party audits that we do in California of every offshore oil rig that are not done routinely in the Gulf, simply because what used to be the old MMS now has a new name, is understaffed. They have trouble hiring the best people because the oil industry pays much higher salaries. And, and it, it's, a, it's a real challenge. No, it is, and I think it's something you can be very proud of here in California. I know it's cost, I mean, it's, it's an expensive proposition, and it's, it's cost you a lot uh, to do that. Uh, but you, you, uh, the consequences of not doing it, we're, we're dealing with in, in, uh, in, in the Gulf of Mexico, and you're not. Uh, and so from an economic standpoint, you know, you're, I, I applaud what has happened here uh, to, to, to balance that. that, that uh, 
Who knows where the first offshore oil well was in the world was built? We we'll give you a prize if you get the right town, the town, state. Summerfield? Summerfield, California. I get the prize. <laughs> <laughs> Who else has a question or a comment? Larry? Did we? You have another one? Yeah. We don't even have a book to sell tonight. But we... <laughs> he usually makes me buy a book for every question. Oh, that's okay. okay. Um, I've seen reports that the skimming picked up you know, 1% of the oil, some very small percentage, and that the burning took up another 1% of the oil, and the estimates of the oil release are, uh, you know, three or four times what a lot of the, can, can vary three to eight times what you normally see in the report. Um, it occurs to me that, it, are we just lucky that the current broke off an eddy and let it settle, or is anything we are capable of doing, can it make any difference if the current doesn't help? Something like that. Um, basically, the best, no, uh, there was a lot of effective work done to keep it out of those weapons. I have to say. And that was mostly the chemical dispersants and those types of things. Very little effect uh, from skimming. It didn't do much. The burning didn't do much either. Uh, but certainly the, the booming uh, off of some areas was effective and the dispersants was, was as well. So there are things we can do. Uh, but. There are a lot of lessons to be learned. I'll, I'll tell you one is that uh, I work real closely with a lot of local communities like Orange Beach, Alabama, and other places where they have very sophisticated emergency management systems that deal with local situations. Uh, like, for example, even like a, like a, a sargassum mats that wash up on the beach and, and local spills, and they know their, their areas really well. What happened, the big complaint was that the feds uh, took over. Uh, they, they, Treated, treated it as a military operation and did what they could, but they didn't coordinate with the locals very much as to, who know their waters. And if there had been closer coordination with them and to, to give guidance of where they should have placed booms or done activity, they could, have, they could have minimized a lot of the problem. This is a learning thing that you, it, what we have to understand the scale that they had to deal with the Coast Guard was just, was huge, it's where it was located. So uh, it was something that we really weren't prepared uh, to deal with. And so these are lessons to be learned. The other thing, well, I'd like to come back to the point you made with using a concussion as an analogy, because I think it is a good one. No matter how big this was, it was an event, and nature is resilient to events. Nature is far less resilient to chronic conditions, like whether it's eutrophication, the input of nutrients from the Mississippi River, or climate change. That That's, as you say, that's where we're going to take a toll, and... and uh, we, we should reduce the number of these events and respond more effectively, but if we don't pay attention to the chronic effects, that's where we lose the game. Who has another one? We're going to take one more and then what, tell you what we're going to do. We have, among the group here, we have our aquarium class that is after the Gulf, what did we learn? And everybody else, if you want to, you can leave, except the people who are taking that class, and if they leave, they flunk. <laughs> but, but, and, 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 and that is. <laughs> goes for you too, Lee. Anybody else though who wants to stay and continue the discussion, you're welcome to stay. But how about one more question before we we let those people leave who want to? I think we should have one from one of these two lawyers up here. There's one back there. I'm going to go to Bill then. You were at our forum. Doctor, can you just talk about we can talk about the Baldies and how we haven't learned our lesson. With respect to financing, uh, it seems to me while the technologies and the response uh, tactics maybe haven't improved, wouldn't you agree that Congress and state governments put in place laws that would actually fund the assessment work? And those are the studies that weren't funded uh, after ICSOP and after uh, that Exxon Valdez in the first instance. Yeah, in fact, one, one of the outcomes of Exxon Valdez was uh, the, the All Scope Pollution Act. And part of that was called was the Natural Resource Damage Assessment, which was a NERDA, we call it for short. And this is the federal process by which we evaluate uh, any kind of uh, insult like this. And it's a tremendously powerful tool, and, and that we're very much involved with the, the work we're doing on the benthos is all NERDA-related work right now. And what I'm talking about there is this process. You know, it, it's a civil process. It's not a criminal process. And it works in this way. It's like, you know, when you when you sue somebody, if, you, if you're going to go sue somebody and say they, they harmed you, 
when you're suing them, you have to prove that there was damage to you. And that's a difficult thing to do in some cases. But what NERDA did under federal law turned that around. And basically, if you're a designated natural resource trustee, and all the states have trustees and the feds do as well, we go out uh, and do an assessment of the damage of an oil spill and uh, make a determination of what that damage was and then take the responsible party to court. And it, the process is turned around. That responsible party now has to prove we're wrong. And that's a much more difficult process. And uh, so that, that was one of the things that came out of that. Uh, also, the, there was the ability to set up a local state responses uh, to, to spills. So there's a number of things that came out of there policy-wise that did stick and that did help and it did, was very beneficial and will be beneficial in responding to this bill. So that's exactly right. We, not, a, not a lot of analogies between uh, Valdez and the spill as far as biology and, and those type of things, but, but the outcome is a very positive, so that's a good point. This is our last one, and then we'll take a short break. Uh, first, a quick comment, just to contrast the, the cost of an oil platform versus a research ship, and how we have tens of thousands of platforms and two research ships. But my question is, um, on climate change, you found that the, the uh, winter temperatures were rising. I wonder if you have found any ecological impacts from that yet. Uh, two parts. One is uh, about uh, two research. No, actually, we have zero research ships in the Gulf of Mexico. We, we lost those a number of years ago. The ships we have there now, we borrow. Uh, and one of them is a private one that we, we borrow. And it used to, it, it's the irony of it is uh, one of these ships uh, the, uh, that used to be uh, the uh, part belonged to Texas A&M. It was oceanographic research. It was, it was sold to a private entity, and now we're leasing it back. Uh, so uh, we're paying the price for not having that there. Uh, ecological impact, we are, one, we are seeing what, we are, what we're seeing uh, as an impact of the increasing uh, winter temperatures is that there are a number of species, snook, mangrove, snapper, and some invertebrate species that are moving up and invading, moving up into, into Texas and other parts of the Gulf of Mexico because of that, and displacing uh, other species. Uh, things like flounder are disappearing. Uh, some of them are moving north, but basically the population is just shrinking. So we're beginning to see those types of things. At least that's obvious to us. We probably are not monitoring other things, but those things we can see. Uh, I think, Larry, say something, though, about uh, even though there's a lack of dedicated research vessels within the Gulf, the number of vessels, including fishing vessels, involved after this spill was an impressive number. Well, it, it's, in fact, yeah, we, we have more research vessels in the Gulf of Mexico than we've had in, in 20 or 30 years. I think, really, in fact, we can't even find crews for them. If any of you out there would like an experience at sea, uh, I'm desperately short of people who will go out uh, and spend uh, spend time pulling up cores and working on ships. Uh, I gave this talk at the Shed, uh, a similar one to the Shed Museum we talked about in Chicago. I've got three volunteers from there, three people coming down that are now working on <laughs> ships as a result. So if you want to come out to Texas, get on a ship and see what oceanographic work is like, I've got a ship for you <laughs> if, if you want to go. All you have to do is be able to pick up 90 pounds, not think too much, and work long, long hours, and stay at sea for maybe six weeks at a time. You can do that, come see me. Uh, but no, that, that, that has been uh, one of the things that had the silver lining uh, to uh, you know, it, it's, it's a, what's an ill wind that blows no one good. We have brought resources into the Gulf now to begin to answer some of these questions that are not only of, of importance to response to oil spills, or something, but just basic understanding of the Gulf of Mexico. And it's a great boon to what we do not have. Thank you. So we're going to take a five minute break. Those of you who want to leave or need to leave, you please go out this back door off to the left, this side. And for our class and anyone else who wants to stay for some more discussion, please do. All right, we're going to resume our class. And so uh, if I could get everyone to, to have a seat. Yeah. This is one of your students. Oh. The, quest, the question is, should he pass? Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> All right, now, don't pass to the professor, you won't pass it on. <laughs> All right, so we, we've got a, a few minutes. This is your opportunity as our class. Ask some questions. Keep in mind the, the sessions that we've had. And uh, here's a guy who spent his life studying the Gulf of Mexico. 
scientist, studied oil spills. He was responsible for the living marine resources for 20 some years for the state of Texas. So he's a steward, a scientist, a manager, now the head of the Hart Institute, which is an institute at Texas A&M dedicated to integrated multidisciplinary studies of the Gulf of Mexico to ensure that balance between economy and the environment. It was created through an endowment by a uh, man who made a lot of money in publishing and real estate, Mr. Hart. And this is a, a, a great opportunity for you to have a conversation with Larry McKinney. So who wants to ask the first one? Tracy, you look like you have a question, even though you're not in the class. You've missed one of them yet. Well, then you can you know, have to get that tough, tough professor. See, the best you can get, I guess, is a C, right? No. We'll stay late after class, we'll work on that. Extra credit, I need extra credit. Uh, I'd like to take your, your um, the analogy you used of the concussion just a little bit further, and now we're going a little bit away from science and into speculation. But if we take the concussion further, what is going to be the catastrophe that's going to knock us out? That's going to be the, where we're not going to be able to recover from it in a way that will make people truly change? Well, it, uh, I don't know about truly change, but you talk about what will knock it out. What you have to understand is it's, the popular never will be that. It's all, the system is always going to change. It's going to be something. It may be completely different than what we're used to or what we think is healthy, but it'll, it'll, it'll change or respond. Uh, I think the biggest issue, I, I think, that we'll have to deal with is climate change. I think. That, that's going to be the, the big driver for, for us in the Gulf, maybe other places, obviously other places as well. But that will be the thing that ch changes the system to something we may not recognize today. Yeah, you can look around the country and around the world at how nature has responded to these concussions whether it was the spill of PCBs in, in the Hudson River or atomic testing in, in, in the yeah. atolls in the Pacific. Uh, nature is remarkably resilient to incidents, but to these chronic stresses, that's, that's the, what really does it to you. Great. Getting back to the political will, uh, President Obama has just declared this seven-year moratorium on uh, any more deep water drilling. Uh, in two years, he may not be in office anymore and will have a change as far as the environment goes. The people in the Gulf are saying that that's taking jobs away from them, uh, that the economy and all needs those the drilling. Do you really think that in this country, in this environment, that we have the political will? My, my point on the political will is, is do we have the will to balance those things? I think we do need the economics on the side of it. I mean, we're going we're to have to have that. Uh, we're going to have to have oil and gas for some time as we move to other situations. So we're going to have to find a way to make that balance. So my, we've always had the political will to do the economic development. That, that's been easy. The other part is, is trying to convince that can we protect the environment at the same time. The only lesson, one of the lessons I hope we learn out of this is that it's economically critical that we protect the environment because when you don't, the economic consequences are huge. Ask BP, yeah. what all that is can. So I don't know if I'm getting at your, at your point of where you want to go or, or what you're trying to get at there, but um, I don't know if we do have that for the goal to do it. I, I don't know. Say a word about the earlier moratorium. The, the feeling there was that, that it was strictly a political statement to take the heat off. Oh, as far as right after this bill? Right after no, yeah, that, that, that was. I, I think that, that, and I think he had no, no choice. And uh, this is just since we're just talking this, this class. Nobody, I mean, nobody's listening. Nobody's listening. Even, the class, even the class isn't listening. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, the, well, as we're doing it, uh, you know what, President, opened more offshore waters? Do all uh, do drilling than any other president? Obama. Oh, wow. Before he closed this, I mean, if he opened it up. Unfortunately, he chose to open it up about one or two, about two months before the Deepwater Horizon hit. Right. And I would tell you that, oil, and this is something uh, I, you know, we work with oil companies. I know a lot of those folks. I thought they did the oil companies did that president a great disservice because he opened up those areas for oil and gas, and they didn't do anything to stand up and and, and basically take responsibility for it. And when and when uh, 
uh, this, this spill occurred, he had no choice. Absolutely no choice. For several reasons. One political reason he had to do it. But also, there was a real question. When that happened, anyone said, wait a minute, are we, have we overstepped the technology? Have we, have we extended that technology down there and, and we're not? And it's not capable and it's not? We have a whole big issue there. Or was it managed? So he did have to do that. And I think it was responsible. Where, whether or not he should have removed that moratorium more quickly when it began to find out what was going on, that, that's, a, that's an issue. Uh, last week, one of our speakers said that with the short memories we have, that he had searched the newspapers to see if there was anything about the oil spill, and there was nothing. So how do you keep that up? Because with everything that happens and with a different kind of a disaster or a murder or a uh, some kid taking off in schools with a gun. We forget about what happened in the Gulf. And that means there's no political will to keep the legislators doing something. No, you're exactly right. And that, that's why it is a, of course I do things like this. And, and, I, and I do this around the Gulf and we work on our legislators back home to, to, in, in the Gulf to, to deal with it. But that's, that's a real, real concern. I don't have a good answer for it, except, except we have to keep trying. I mean, we have organizations like the Gulf Alliance and others that keep the pressure on from a legislative standpoint. In this case, there's there's so much, so many dollars involved. When EPA, uh, for example, we talked about NERDA, that's one place where they'll get funds to do restoration. But EPA can levy fines uh, of $1,000 a barrel of oil spilled up to $4,300 a barrel, depending on gross negligence. Uh, and when they make those decisions, we're talking about 15 to 20 billion dollars. So even that begins to get the attention of, of, of uh, Congress, that, that much money. So there's enough money associated with the consequences of this. I think it will, will keep, it, keep it to some level uh, on, on our minds. But you're right, it, it, history has proven that we, we forget it pretty quickly and we don't follow through and we learn it all, we deal with it all over again. I'd like to get your response to something uh, one of the people from the oil industry in our forum said. He said he, his comment was that he thought calling this a spill was a terrible misstatement, that it was a blowout. A spill implies that you have a finite amount of liquid and it's released uh, in a very short period of time. Exxon Valdez was a spill because there was only a certain volume. And that in this case it was a blowout and if it had not been successfully capped, it would have been spewing oil for decades. No, that's a good point. And it actually, I used to call it a blowout. I mean, that was my, that's, try, try to make that point. But it's just, I've been hammered so much, you know, after a while, it's okay, still. Because I, and I call it that, and I, I try to keep it that way. But, and you're right, because it has the connotation. When I hear spill, it's like somebody puts some milk, spills some milk on the counter and you clean it up. I and mean, that's what spill is, not what this was. This was a, I think, one term I thought was very good is an undersea volcano of oil. This is what you watched it. So, Right. It, it, we don't. We have not characterized it as what it is. It was good option. Who else has a question or a comment? Bob, just go ahead. You can say it loudly. Okay. Uh, your your slide was very interesting of the complex interconnectivity, and and you said that backfilling can go on. I just want to. Do you look at it the other way, possibly? And does it concern you that the, the deep water horizon is right in the middle of, of the, the heart of all of that? Well, that, that was that was our original concern because if, if there was a worse place in the Gulf of Mexico to have an oil spill, I couldn't I couldn't imagine where it might be. Okay. It's there. That's also where the oil is, unfortunately, and that's that's where they're going to go. But it, but that's exactly no, you're right. That's that was a uh, uh, that's why I made that on that slide that, that this was a uh, a potential disaster of a true ecosystem of an entire Gulf ecosystem spill because that oil could have <coughs> could, could have if it hadn't been captured, it could have gone all around the Gulf of Mexico. Well, we're, we're doing benthic, benthic work, uh, and we're doing it on a prescribed uh, method because of the NERDA process. It's a legal process, so we're, we're sampling 
to meet the requirements for this damage assessment, and it's a very, very strict protocol. So that's why, that's why we're doing the patterns that we are and the way we're doing it. Another interesting concept that this same guy came up with in terms of the blowout and the spill was that in the oil industry, he said they, they keep very good logs of near misses. And he said, the trouble is, a near, a near miss doesn't characterize it. We should call them near hits. And you add in there, if it had happened, this is what, what the consequences would have been. And he said, it's driven probably primarily by what happens in the airline industry, because you, a near miss isn't as disturbing as a near hit. It's a near hit. <laughs> and, uh, but, and, and we, we had a, an interesting comparison with uh, the Alpha Piper incident in the North Sea. And uh, Elizabeth Pate Cornell, who was one of the, the leaders in analyzing that one. Again, you know, there were signs r for the days and weeks before that happened that somebody needed to shut it down. The, well, probably, and, there's a, and I can't remember the name of the book, maybe one of you will, that the, the, the author put together, uh, talked about a series of catastrophes and, uh, and compared them. And what he, I think the term was cascading effect, I think he came up with this, that there was something common in all of these uh, really major catastrophes, and it was basically this could never happen. I mean, in each one said, like the Titanic order, it could never happen. But a small thing happened, then another thing happened, then the next. And by the time we got to the that next uh, fourth or fifth level, it was inevitable. It was, it was going to go because no one took action when they could have done it and stopped the whole thing. That's, that was a common feature of these, these major catastrophes. And they, they looked in the North Sea that one of the, the rigs was installed upside down, upside down. Another one in, in, in the Gulf, and I think it was, it was uh, Deepwater Horizon. It was the wrong kind of steel, but the, that steel was available now, and the right kind of steel would have taken, we had to, had, have had to wait several weeks to get it. Mm -hmm. These were the cutters. Yeah. This was, uh, they, they have these devices, the emergency last ditch thing that just basically pinched the pipe and close it shut by sheer mechanical power. But unfortunately, the steel, steel, was not the steel on the cutters were not as, was not as, as good as the steel on the pipe, and it didn't do it. Yeah. And the, now, tell, tell, tell us uh, whether you agree with this. Someone made the statement that one of the big issues was that nobody in the oil industry had ever thought they could have an incident of this magnitude. So it hadn't been thought through, and nobody, it, not just BP, none of the oil industries had a response plan for an incident like this. Worst case scenario. No, and the evidence for the fact that they didn't was that, and this came out during the spill, is because they all have to file, all these companies, and there's several that work in 5,000 feet, as well many of them, uh, and they all have to file these emergency response plans. And when they started looking at these emergency, some reporter got to bring, you know, the brainwave to look at them all, he discovered, he or she discovered, that they were all the same. They had all been cut and pasted from one another. Someone wrote something up, but clearly no one, other companies, they just took it and rearranged it and put all the same information. So clearly no one was actually looking or thinking about it. So they thought, no, it's not going to, it's just a, this is an exercise we have to do to meet a, a federal guideline. It's not a real one. It's never going to happen. And, and that's, it did. Who has the next question? Um, like that, like that. So if we, if we scale that down to a coat hanger, that would be like 12, 13 feet tall for 5,000 feet. I just did the math on a 24 inch pipe. Mm -hmm. It'd be about 13 feet tall with a coat hanger sized wire going down. And that's just to the sea floor. And then how many, how many feet through the sea floor to the? Eight, nine thousand. Yeah, that'd be about right, yeah. So, okay. it, it's scary, isn't it? But, you know, it's oppressive anyway. But one solution would be, we could get oil off the coast of California. We could get it in shallow water. It's under less pressure. We have a better inspection system. We could, we could save, reduce the probability of this kind of a, of a hazard. Do we want that in our state? Yeah. Only no. we put palm trees on the... <laughs> 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 
<laughs> yeah, we, we don't we don't want it here, but we're not willing to give up our cars. You you drove here at night. I drove here at night. It's a it's a very interesting set of issues. From just a technical thing, as you're getting ready to answer this question, it, there was a there was a real issue when when the actual platform burned and fell apart, and you had this stem, a mile long stem of how many tons of steel was breaking up into pieces and falling like spears toward the wellhead. Some, a couple of sections of those, of those pipe came, I mean, within, I mean, from that distance. They could, incredibly close to just spearing that wellhead. And if that had happened, the, the, uh, the blowout preventer, if they had speared it, it would have been all over with. And there was even some concern, and I think it was very legitimate, that's why it took so long to do this, is that as that broke, you had this mile long or some length of pipe floating in the water on top of the blow up, and it was sitting there going like this as it was falling apart, wiggling the case down in the, down into the, below the, the surface. And so the concern was if they put too much pressure on it to try to just like, like stop it from the top, it'd blow out all the bottom and then it was all over with. Nothing would stop it at that point. It would go into the reservoir until the pressure equalized because it'd be nothing to, nothing to cap. It was a, it was a pretty scary, it was a pretty scary scenario. There was a period of time where that was a real, real possibility. So with, you had up uh, on one of your slides uh, one to three, two years and three to five years and so on. If you put up there the impacts on people, and I don't mean the ones who were killed, but the people who make their livings off the, the Gulf, mm -hmm. particularly fishermen and so on, where, where would they fall in this in, to time to recover? That, that was the big, and, and I didn't talk about that, and that's, uh, that's really probably the most tragic part of this type of thing, because I think that I was around them a lot, and I know a lot of those folks. Um, they're still uh, in, in a bind, in many of them, and I'm thinking, some of them will never, they're gone. Uh, but I'm, I'm thinking you know, it will be five to ten years before they really get back to the point, the ones that can survive there. So the biggest impact was not, in this case, environmental, but it was clearly economic for those, for those communities down there. It's just totally devastating because they can't do anything. And way of life. Because totally way of life. That's all they did. And, 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 you, and you talk to some of those people. I mean, entire families, three generations. That's all these people have ever done. It's fish or deal with oysters. I mean, and they don't know anything else. You can't retrain them. And they don't, I mean, that's that's where they live. They're not going to, they can't move them. There's no jobs there. Uh, and so it's a, that, that was the, that's the difference between like a hurricane, which affects everybody in the they, as they talk about it, in these types of things. That, that by far is a big strain. It's just an incredible heartbreak. I mean, it's really, I mean, I had a hard time going out and talking to some of these people, dealing with trying to, just because you see what's happening to their family. They knew, they knew nothing else. They, they had no other way to make a living. And that hasn't gotten enough attention. I no, 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 no. Well, actually, all the on NPR in the morning, they had uh, people go down there and interview them. been talking about me? Well, that's good. But that was. Still, are they still doing that? No, it was, well, it would tomorrow would be the last. Oh, okay. Yeah. But they've been doing it, so that's, that's yeah. good. I mean, and really, they were talking about the mental illness and people yeah. where families are falling apart. Yeah. yeah. And just as you're saying, these generations and people are now having to leave the area. Yeah. And that after Katrina, they felt that people came together, whereas people are, are now, I think that the families are, are splitting up, marriages are falling apart. You know, yeah. Yeah. No, the, 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 those consequences are just going to go on and we won't see it be, it'll be out of the first line. a different reaction. It was much harder on the family. Yeah. It's interesting. You had a question or comment? Oh, um, some people have addressed some of it, but I just said, like, we're in California and New Orleans, you know, in the Gulf of Mexico, like, they just keep, like, they just keep getting hit after hit and of all these catastrophes down there. But, like, the big picture, in my opinion, is greed. Like, the possible, you know, losses, Too hard for me on my schedule and get a bus and you know we're 
are so far removed, but I'm still eating oysters and clams and things that, you know, so I think people tend to forget, like we're saying about the whole, you know, you, you tend to forget because we're not as affected. And it was nice to hear that, okay, the wetlands weren't in the inner interior, the wetlands weren't as affected as we thought they were going to be. And it wasn't as bad as we thought it was initially. And the organisms are breaking down the oil and all this. So then it's like, oh, it wasn't that bad. And like I said, like the potential gain outweighs the losses in a lot of people's opinions and minds. So it's kind of hard. How do we change everyone's opinion and to get them to care about nature and the possible effects of our generations to come? Great question. <laughs> we got all night here. Yeah. No, but that, 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 that's, that's, that's a pretty well put, actually. I mean, uh, one, of the thing, it's, one of the things that happens, particularly in a place like the Gulf, but in many situations where you have this huge natural variability that, that we see in the Gulf of Mexico, that the mm -hmm. systems themselves are resilient, that they move up and down. It's hard to detect when catastrophic changes or cha turning points are being reached because it's so so variable. And so typically in natural resource issues, you don't see it until it's too late or, or very late in, in the system. So that, that's one thing that's concerning. You talk about BP. Uh, yeah, there's several. Uh, Transocean uh, had a big part of that. Uh, Halbert had a big part of it. But under law, uh, BP, uh, they're going to they're going to be they're responsible. They they they. So like the money that they're putting out are drops in the bucket. You know, I mean, they, well, have, I they, they, have, they, have, they have given a lot of money and spent yeah. a lot of resources, but are they hurting that much? Because a couple of years ago, gas was a lot more expensive. No, I mean, they, they uh, actually, because of the potential fines and some of the other things that are going on, they may, they're, they're getting to the point where they actually notice it. I mean, it, it could be, they, they could well, do that. I'm just saying, I don't know where you're going. I said, yeah, it's a huge amount of money. And, uh, I mean, all of them make that type of thing. So basically, it's a risk of doing business, and they and, and they can make it. Of course, the only reason they do business is because there's a demand, okay. and that's I mean they that's have something to do it, and, and we're it, uh, and we just collectively have never been able to do it. I got, I mean, I do have a have a Prius, I drive a Prius, but I also drive a Chevy truck, <laughs> and so all of us, uh, you know, we haven't been able to make that that shift. It was interesting. We were talking earlier over dinner that. Uh, until fairly recently, BP had a very good safety. That's exactly right, and, and that's uh, and we uh, they are were, 15 years ago, one of one of the leaders in safety issues. They had a culture of safety, uh, and they were recognized by industry. But that that changed with leadership of the company, who had a different objective, and that whole culture melted away, uh, and very clearly did. And that's what's coming out of the commission hearings, uh, is that they put their their immediate profit over their long-term sustainability. Uh, they thought they could get away with it, and they clearly didn't until now. But that's that's exactly what happened. They, they were clearly culpable. So should they be penalized to the point where they would go bankrupt? Which is negative damage. That, that should just be responsible for negative damage. Yeah. Whatever that takes. Yeah, well, and hopefully that, they won't go bankrupt. Hopefully they won't. I hope you. And, and the reason. Stronger and you don't want to, because you're exactly right. Uh, I mean, I, I did. I did a lot of interviews. Uh, in fact, I was on with, with uh, what's Tony's last name? Hayward. Hayward. I was actually on a program with him on BBC. We were separate company. We were at the same time. We were doing the same thing. It was kind of interesting. Uh, and they were discussing about the, the beta, which I didn't know at the time. I said, but I thought people may understand how important BP is. I know they're, they're vilified over here. But many, many thousands, I don't know how many people in, in Great Britain, their entire retirement exactly. is based in BP. I mean, if BP goes under, it's a national, it's a national disaster. Uh, no, no, that's just point. I mean, point so you, they need to be, they need to be responsible. They, so far, they seem to be. I mean, they're stepping forward and, and you know, and funding these types of things they should. And so you want them to survive, to pay for those damages, and learn from that lesson. That's what you're saying. I think that's what we best would hope. That's what, that's what basically saves me saying it's, it's, it is an amazing thing, and it seems like uh, no matter how much we abuse it, it, it comes back. The concern is, is, again, we just talked about the chronic issues you got to think about. Those things are they're happening, and if, if these incidents build up and push those, that, that's a real concern. You, you can't be complacent. And probably, I think there's a growing, growing recognition that the single largest threat is ocean acidification. And uh, it's got, not getting very much attention. But the ocean is 30, 35% more acidic than before the Industrial Revolution. 
And if we stop emitting all greenhouse gases tomorrow, it would continue to get more acidic for the next century. And yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's because we, we deal with it in our, in our sanctuary programs because uh, deal with uh, coral reefs. I mean, there is a real, I mean, there's a real possibility that coral reefs, as we know them, will convert from the coral reefs to algal reefs. Real <laughs> coral reefs, as we know them, will disappear in our lifetime. There's a real possibility that will not be coral reefs within our lifetime. And, that, and whether it's man-made or natural, let's just look at the facts of the change. That's a real possibility. So that's a, we were talking about changes or things disappearing. Well, it changes, it'll you know, change the algae and do other sponges and those type of things, but it won't be coral reefs. What? Yes, we see. We, uh, not oh, as far oh, as far as uh, related to oil spill type of thing. Yeah. Uh, not not this year before the spill. There was a, a pretty significant. Last year was a significant bleaching uh, uh, episode going on. It seems to have cleared up now. It's not, we're not in that again. It's, it's you know, it's, it's obvious stuff, but it was pretty significant last year. Is the oil is over the the polyps? Does it expel the rosin or what's its response to that? Uh, I don't know. We haven't seen it. I'm sure there's been some studies, but I don't know what, what that I think that's all going on. There are they are busy with the new MMS, the, whatever it's called. I can't even remember. What it's uh, they're they're rapidly making those those amendments and changes. They are they are working on that. And how do we know that they're going to work? We don't. We don't. We're, it's our best our best guess. You can't get, eliminate the risk, but that's the whole field of risk analysis and risk management and. Uh, trying to build as much redundancy into these systems, doing the third-party audits and, and so on. And it's like when, when NASA first started to fly satellites, they had an absolutely terrible record, absolutely terrible. And, and it took them, I forgot, seven or eight years, mm -hmm. and now they have one of the best safety records. And uh, same thing was true with the Navy. Changing those cultures takes years but it can, it can be done. And, and that's, I think, that's probably, I want to remember that one. I think those are two good ones. That. I, mean, I updated my talk on that. That's, that's exactly right. There's not that culture of, of safety. It's been in all they have not needed. The culture has been drill, baby, drill. I mean, that's, and, that, and that's, we talked about you know, where it was pushed from. And so it just has not been there. So they just don't have, in many cases, so they, they don't have, this, our best hope in this incident is they begin to develop that culture and it moves, moves forward. And that the federal regulators that do their job and, and push them in that direction. Put that guy like that's what they do. Are they also examining well construction details? Because you said we have piping change. Could this happen to have some other rig that's currently in operation? Did they use the right cement sales? This was a problem with this oh, well. You know, is anyone going back and having them prove that the construction that they currently have on their operating rig is of sufficient standard that it doesn't have these defects that we're talking about? I don't know. I don't, I don't know either, but you're right. design review is something that has not been rigorously overseen by the federal government. And, and it, it's, it's not, it, it's so, MMS was so poorly funded, so poorly understaffed, and when you think about the number of rigs and the number of wells, there's not enough manpower to do it. So it's not having more regulations, it's enforcing the regulations that we have and providing the oversight. Yeah, I think what we ought to do, we all, we all should be paying more money for gas, significantly more, and the money should be going in to transitioning to renewables, and it also should be going into making the recovery safer. Um, we, we, even at, what are we paying now? Three dollars and seven or eight cents here, you're paying less now. You are. Not much. But, but, but you know, we were in, in France recently, uh, between, I think it was close to seven dollars a gallon. Um, well, that's called a tax, and, and I agree. But yeah, try, try to get that one. Bob. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> probably wouldn't get. It. Yeah, if you run, out, you could run for office, Bob. I'm wanting for higher taxes. Uh, <laughs> I'd vote for you, Bob.
saying earlier, after that first week or so, the response really was pretty amazing, I think. The coordination between the Coast Guard and NOAA and, and the locals, it, there's a lot of thrashing around in that first week, and uh, uh, TSA, that, that wasn't the right person to, to have in Homeland Security to have in charge, um, yeah. but then they got that Allen. Yeah. That Allen's that a good, I, 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 knew, I know him, I've known him for, for years from Katrina, that's where I worked with him. And he was he was the he was the right person at the right time to, to deal with it. We had a good person there. Yeah. We're gonna we're gonna take one more Larry and then we're gonna call it a night. What's the what's the level of uh, financial liability that BP's looking looking at? What's the range when you're done with the, your your assessment is going to be how many barrels and, and how much per barrel mm -hmm. a fine, right? Is that what you're well, the, the NERD process uh, is de deals only with the environment, damages to the environment, and restoration to pre-spill or pre-incident condition. And so what happens, you go through a process to first evaluate exactly what the damage was. That's where we are right now, trying to determine what, if any, damage was there. And then you take that to the next stage, okay, if there was damage, how do you restore that? Because the goal is not to collect money, but it's to do restoration. Uh, in many cases, you make the calls that, okay, we want to restore this, and this is what it'll cost, and they write you a check, and you go do it, or sometimes the response part will do it. So that's one aspect of it. There is, um, the EPA will make make a determination uh, of, of either uh, gross negligence on the spill, and if it's gross, basically the EPA under the Clean Water Act can find a company, $1,000 a barrel, in this case, for every barrel spill, $4 million barrels, $4 million, or $4 million times a thousand, or if it was gross negligence, which every indication is that it was there, that fine goes up to forty-three hundred dollars a barrel. So forty-three hundred times four million is the total that they will owe for that. Then there are lawsuits uh, that that are out there from individuals <coughs> and so forth that they're still liable for. So there's we don't know what their liability will be yet. Typically, what will happen? A NERDA they'll come up with a, a, a finding. Uh, of how much it would cost to do restoration. They'll negotiate that and settle it. That's typically what happens. Uh, the uh, EPA will just be a straight determination. They'll make the call. And there's, some, there's been some uh, early negotiations that said, okay, uh, we'll give each state $20 billion. And let's settle it. Uh, that's, that's one thing that seems to be floating around the table. So there's some of those kind of negotiations going on. So you, there is no real limit to BP's liability except what can be proved against them in the court. Yeah. It's a lot of money. It's Even a huge, It's a huge amount of money. And I agree with you that they should be held accountable <coughs> for everything they were responsible for. But it's also discouraging, I think, when we talk about greed. There are people who, who didn't suffer damage. Oh, yeah, no. But they're going after BP because they're an easy target. And, uh, All right. This has been a really good good discussion. Bob, go ahead. This better be good, though. <laughs> <laughs> this is your A or your B. <laughs>
gates of the of the levees to flush fresh water down to try to keep the oil out of the out of the estuary hmm. areas. Do you think that was a good idea? That sounds like somebody thought through that. No. Caused more dangerous than it did good. <laughs> okay, so so is that a lesson to learn that don't don't do that anymore? And, and what do you yeah, because you said just leave the oil but they flush. So which what's your well, opinion? Uh, flushing can work. I mean, when you have oil in marshes, you, you have some charges. One, if it's the right type of marsh, if it's a pretty high marsh, you can actually burn it. Burn the top vegetation layers off and it burns the oil, but you don't don't disturb the roots if it's dry enough, so that works. Uh, you can flush oil and flush it back out if you do it locally. What they did is they put oil up in the top of the system and never really made it down to where the oil was, so it's freshened up the middle part of the marsh and cause huge ecological damage because it freshened the marshes up when it shouldn't have been freshened up. Okay. And so that's, that's what happened there. They built these farcical sand burns, total waste of time. They're still building it, by the way, uh, for some reason. That's a, Janelle Jin, Jindal wanted to do it. They had some cause behind it. But what is happening, they're using up sand. You know, when you're doing restoration work, uh, there's a lot of mud in those, mar those wetlands down there, and you can't build islands. You can't raise land with silts and clay. It has to be sand. They're taking these sands that could be used for restoration and put them, take them out of out of uh, availability for future restoration, doing huge amounts of damage. But it was politically something he thought he had to do. So a lot of bad mistakes. And, and after uh, after Exxon Valdez went, or we, the feeling was use high power hoses to get the oil off Steam the rocks, and it clearly did more damage oh, absolutely. than the oil ever did. And, and yeah. so my my far prevention is the you know, reducing risk. Is, is, the, is, the, is the best 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 method because once it gets out, many many cases nature let nature take care of it. It's probably once it's there, let it let it deal with it. Larry, thank you. This yeah, was yeah. really great. Thank you. Thank you.